Well, thank you, Dave, and uh, thank uh, Basketball Immersion and uh, Golden Ticket. I mean, again, as everybody says, this is amazing, and it's just a way to share ideas, and that's all I plan to do tonight. I'm, I'm going to try to take and just share some of the ideas of some of the things I've been trying and experimenting with over this past year and from the reading that I've been doing and talking with people, some of the ideas that I can't actually wait to get out and try in my laboratory when I get a chance to get back into it. So, um, and people who know me, that this is one of my sayings I, I say all the time. We, we coach people who play basketball. And that means one is I have to know how to coach the individual person. Uh, that's very important. So I really think this is drilling down. This is what it is. How do I direct their attention to the right thing at the right time? That's what I'm trying to do. Help them focus on the right thing. And that's just not on the basketball court. That could be helping them focus on their schoolwork. That could be helping them focus on, hey, you need to get in shape. Or helping them focus their attention on a, a personal problem that they're dealing with. So I've got to be able to know my player. We now call it KYP. But that is so important. And KYP, know your player. And then how do I help them direct their attention to the right thing? And then I got to get all these individuals to play together. And if you're familiar with the forming, storming, norming, and performing of group, group dynamics, we use this a lot, and uh, I find it really helps. Uh, one of the things we found with our national teams is you have a very condensed, and how do you content, condense this forming where you bring them all together? There's going to be a little bit of a storming where people are challenging, trying to figure out where they fit, and then you get them into that norming stage, and but to go from norming where everybody's now kind of understanding to performing, that's those shared experiences. Uh, and if you listen to, uh, we had a, a broadcast from our senior staff and Lisa made a great point about, it was those close games that you get involved with where it's coming down in the storm at the end and where you perform, have to perform there. Th those are the ones you really, really learn from. And, and I think that that's, that's important that you really think about how is your team growing through these different stages. And then I got to know basketball. And if you've been watching these clinics, you're getting lots on the basketball. I'm going to focus more on some of these first ones. How do I coach the individual and how do I get them to play together? So I really like this. This is a, this is a, from a David Wallace Foster gave a famous speech, but it's basically there's this fish swimming and he sees the other two fish and he says, how's the water? And the two other fish, well, what the hell is water? But that's about perspective and blind spots. There, there are things that are happening that we don't even see. And I find myself that I really have to focus on what are my blind spots and what are my biases. And I'm constantly trying to find things that take me out of my comfort zones. I'm learning a lot from non-basketball. I'm learning a lot from not from sport. I'm always trying to find ways to challenge my thinking and to challenge uh, and more diversified thinking. I think diversity is one of the most important things we can have. I think one of the things you can't have is all like-minded people on your staff. Uh, and an old Don McCray, who was a mentor of mine, said to me one time, he says, Mike, you can't have all milk drinkers. And I knew exactly what he meant. You've got to be able to have that diversity. And, and again, that leads into my context thing I always talk about. We have to know who plus why, and that's going to equal what and how. And and we always start on with the who and the why. So we have to know who we are and why we're coaching them before we get in the what's in the house. And that goes back to that diversity. You have to understand those people. So who are we coaching? What age, gender, level? So the first thing that somebody asks me of questions, I'm going to ask, well, who, who are we talking about? Give me, give me a description. And then why are they playing and why are you coaching? And what's the purpose of your program? I think you really have to be able to answer this question. And for me, it's always been developing future leaders by teaching life lessons through sport. And when I figured that one out a long, long time ago, it really helped me solve problems. It really, when I get into the storms or I get into a tough situation, should I play this player? Should I bench this player? Should I cut this player? Am I developing a future leader? And am I teaching them a lesson through sport? And it really helped me uh, get out of a lot of difficult situations because I, I stayed true to who I was. I'm always going to push this, this concept of transformational versus transactional coaching. And I was so pleased to see uh, Coach Jockums last night, his, his presentation. He brought this point out and some of our other coaches. And I, I'm very proud in Canada that I think in general, most of our coaches are transformational. Uh, when I get to talk with people around the world, 
they're always impressed with that that's uh, part of us and and to me there's four key principles that i think are important one do we inspire our athletes do we believe in them and how do you use their time and and playing time is a tough one you could be telling a player i believe in you i believe in you, but if you never play them that's tough and i think you've got to find out ways to play players i'm not promoting five on five off every four minutes. I'm not promoting equal playing time, but I'm saying you've got to find ways to show that you believe in that player. That's very important. Second one, we got a role model. That's pretty self-explanatory. Here's the big one. You've got to challenge them and especially to think. I think we're good at challenging them on the physical, be tough, come on, work hard, but you've got to challenge them to think. And uh, I love Chris did a presentation and he talked about the pause. Most of us are not comfortable with the pause when we ask a question. And we want, we want to fill that in. And, and, and if you're going to allow players to think, you've got to be comfortable with pauses and quietness. And just be patient and let them think. And then the big one too is treating them as an individual, not as a position, not as a starter or a sub or a rookie as a senior. They are a unique player. And you've got to get to know them and I think Coach Jockums last night did a great job of talking about not only you got to get to know them, but what's motivating them? Why are they here? What is it's important to them? And the more you can start to figure that out, the more you can impact that, in, that player as an individual, and you're going to change their lives. And that's what we're trying to do, I think. I always, Goldilocks, and it's always a balance. And that's the art of this coaching thing, right? Too much, too little, just right. And I, I don't have this solved yet. I don't think you ever solve it, but you're always experimenting a little of this, a little of that, and you figure it out. But it's in the reflection that you do that will really help you figure out what was the right balance. I could do my whole presentation on this. I think this is one of the most important things, and I think in this time of COVID, this is what you should be doing as a coach. If I had one suggestion for you, is really going through and planning your, your success. Um, <clears throat> starting with what's your vision on the bottom, right? Your purpose, what's your learning environment going to look like? What's your culture? What, what things do you value? And how are you going to develop leadership? Are you going to use a leadership team? Are you going to use captains? Is it all done through you? Is it your veterans? But you, sh you should be thinking through these different boxes. The middle row is really, that's your planning your season. That's your yearly training plan, your YTP. And I think Erin Aaron Macalina did an excellent job of talking about her, her uh, YTP and hers. Uh, your strategies and your tactics or your style of play. Uh, how are you going to teach your decision makings? What are the decisions and the skills? How are you going to compete? And then this top row is what's going to look like in the storm. And how are you going to make sure that your team can execute how are they going to show trust, which is that shared experiences of trusting each other? And then composure, which is to me, it's if they can stay connected and if they can stay uh, focused on the right things in the storm, they're composed. And then that's going to lead you to success. So we use this a lot in our planning. And I also use it with debriefing. So I'm going to de de be debriefing coaches all the time on different ones of these boxes. And I think it's a great way to help you in that, in that area. So we're going to look at the learning box and we're going to look at three key things I think are important in your learning environment. Do you let them wobble? Do you create a safe learning environment? And does the things you do in your learning environment transfer and get retained in the game? And I hope this video shows. So we'll try it and see Dave. Did that show up already, right, Dave? Just give it me a did, thumbs yeah. up. Absolutely. Good. That is great coaching. That is awesome coaching because they let her wobble. They were not giving her feedback. They were not uh, telling her, to, no, no, you're doing that wrong. Start again. No, you're a little too off balance. They didn't give her on her first repetition, stop her and try to do an error detection correction. They let her try on her own. And you could see in the face how much learning was going on. And it was safe. 
they were there to protect her if she fell, but they weren't over safe. And she was allowed to be vulnerable. She was allowed to look a little silly without anybody ridiculing her. And yes, everything that she was doing was going to transfer and get retained in her walking. They weren't making her stand still and take one foot and just move it back and forth a bunch of times. Okay, this will transfer. No, they were letting her do the skill of walking as the best she could at that time. Okay, so that's what great coaching is, is like. And I really like this term of repetition without repetition. There's where I got it from. And it's the idea that we're not trying to learn a perfect movement pattern that can be reproduced in the game. So we're not working on a perfect shot form that's the same for everybody. We're not working on a perfect pattern of a, move, of a play. Uh, that was the way I was taught how to coach. That you, you, you start by teaching these skills, trying to get this perfect skill form down, and then we can go in the game and it will show up in the game. Well, we've learned and through research that that, that doesn't really happen because all movement has to have variability and stability. And I'll talk a little bit more later on this. And, and so where it's led to is, and that's where we get these ideas of random versus uh, uh, block drills, variable versus constant, and distributed versus mass. So we don't want to be doing the same skill from the same spot all the time for a half hour. We want to mix up the skill, mix up the spot we're doing skills from, and we want to distribute that through our entire practice. And, and again, the research says there's going to be greater transfer and retention if we do that. And so that's one of the things that I try to keep track of in a practice is, are these sorts of things occurring? And to me, I now try to teach the game through the decisions or the challenges that the game presents. Instead of in the old days, like I say, I would do all these skills, usually on air, and then I would hope that those would transfer into my five on five. Well, now I start with a game like situation and there's decisions or challenges that the athletes are prevented, presented with on offense and defense. And then we're going to let them try to figure those things out. And we teach the skills through those decisions. Now, anybody else who knows me, this, this idea of PVAD, and there's a little bit of a science behind it. And I, I mean, I, I adopted this from a Tori Messina years ago. And uh, it's, it's been the, one of the most important things, I think, in my coaching. But the positioning, the person has to be able to detect what's going on. They have to see what they should see. And so an, an example is if this little girl here in the blue, if she can't dribble with her left hand with her head down or without her head up, she's not going to see the cue she needs to see. So what she anticipates and what she decides is going to be a problem. So we have to be able to get athletes to be in a position. So this is where I may go backwards and help an athlete. If they can't be in a proper position to see, they may have to do a little work on their own to get that fixed. The vision is what are the cues they need to see? And what is it they need to, to observe to make their decisions? And then what are they anticipating doing based on what they see? And one of the problems we run into is they don't have a big enough tool in their toolbox sometimes. So they may only anticipate, well, I'm going to dribble. Well, we have to help them with their decisions uh, that they can do. So help them with their offense. So an offense, she could keep it, pass it, or pivot. The defender in the yellow, she could be reactive or assertive. So there's lots of things they can do, but there's some things that either limit or attract them to their choices. First of all, skill level. So as I said, if, if she can't dribble with her left hand, she's probably going to pick it up or try to pass it because she can't dribble. That's going to limit her choices. Uh, it could be her experience or habit. It could be just every time she catches the ball, she dribbles. I see that a lot with uh, when we try, we've introduced dynamic one-on-one. -on -one. The kids think that every time they catch the ball, they got to dribble. So therefore, they're not really making a decision. And then physically, she may not be strong enough. She may not be fit enough late in the game. She's just tired or she's just not strong enough to make a pass. So that's going to limit. She can't make that pass. So she's not going to use that as an option. And then social emotionally, it could be her self-identity. I mean, I've seen players who I see, I'm a point guard. I've got to show I can dribble. Even though all the cues are telling you don't dribble there, I call it the tunnel. They see a little tunnel with light at the end of the tunnel and they get trapped seeing the light and they want to go down that tunnel. And it's like, you're just going to get trapped. 
but their, their self identity is I'm a guard. I need to be able to handle this. Or she's turned it over three times and she doesn't have the resiliency. That's going to, she won't dribble the next time, even though it's the right decision, she's not going to dribble. And then mentally, is she connecting with other people? Is she maintaining her composure? And then coaching. I, I as a coach have a lot of impact because of how uh, they determine what coach wants. And especially when you're coaching younger players, they want to please us. And if, if my body language, if my feedback is, is encouraged to them not to make mistakes, they're probably not going to go outside the com comfort zone. So that's why sometimes just letting them wobble and not reacting to mis mistakes is important if you're trying to build on this decision making. And then culturally, different cultures have different things. Uh, I get it from people all around the world that how do you get your players to, to hit the floor so much? And I'm like, well, they just do it. It's not it's culturally, it's so accept that that's what you do. But in other countries, uh, they can't get some of their female players to dive on the floor because it's just not culturally accepted or expected. So you have to know who you're coaching. And I talk with coaches, say, in other countries, and I'll tell me, you can't do what you do in our country. You would not be able to do that because uh, it would not be culturally accepted. Okay. And then this whole idea of creativity and, and creativity is this, uh, doing things a little bit unconventionally. And I've always defined it as, it was something that was unique. It kind of was like, oh, aha, oh, yeah, I never saw that, thought about that. But here's the cue, it has to solve the problem. And, you know, I can be shooting the ball by throwing it under my leg. That's unique and it's aha, but it's not solving the problem. So it's, it's got to solve a problem. And, and this has constantly been happening in the game. So this is just a picture of Kenny Sailors who, uh, you know, first player have a jump shot. Well, his problem one, he was small and he used to play against his brothers and he couldn't get his shot off until he figured out if I jump, I might be able to get my shot off. That's how, why he solved it is, is because he couldn't shoot. This is Earl Monroe. I have a, an affinity for Earl Monroe because he was one of the first players to use the spin dribble. And again, he wasn't super quick. So he figured out playing in the streets of Philadelphia that if I spun, I could create an advantage. Well, my story with that was first time we saw Earl Monroe back when I was playing, we tried it. And of course my coach said, if you bring that stuff in here, you're not going to play. Don't be doing that stuff in my gym. Well, we still did it, but we just made sure we didn't do it when the coach was around. Right. And then of course you have Seth Curry shooting and, and Jay just talked about this, these deep threes. Well, I mean, here we got two defenders contesting on a, a he from almost half court. It's close to the half court than the three point line, but that's still a, a, a creativity because he's solving a problem that he sees happening in the game. And I think when we allow players to wobble, that's what's going to happen. This is something I've been experimenting with in my practices. So I'm going to go through this idea that I try to do what I call an explore part where we present the challenge. Then we exploit where we try to, we talk about it, we debrief it and break it down, add some more information. And then we try to execute it, go back into another game. And this is what I've been experimenting with in practice, and I, I'm really liking uh, the results I'm getting out of it. So I'll give you an example. So we have a challenge. Again, we're not trying to get a perfect movement. We're trying to solve a problem. So here is the problem. We were giving up too many uh, threes on defense, and in offense, we weren't moving the ball enough. So I put them in this formation, and I said, okay, here's the, here's the rules. Offense, you can't really move outside your area. No cutting, no dribbling. And defense, don't give up the three-point shot. Play. And they play. And I basically don't talk. Only time I would talk is if they totally don't get the drill. Or maybe reminding the subs if they're subs or if I'm doing it two ends. But I'm letting them play. And is this a teaching, learning, or competing drill? It's probably a learning drill. We're not really playing it like the real game. So it's a learning drill. But it's coaching on the fly. But I'm not giving any feedback. I'm just observing and listening and seeing how they're solving the problems. In the exploit, we're gonna, what, we're gonna stop and debrief. What went well? You know, what's, what problems? And then I get a chance to load in some new information. If there's some information that they're missing, they don't have it in their cup, and it's not been able to take another cup, I get to add some information in. And then we can either load or deload the drill. So what we did was we said, okay, let's put some specific words and responsibilities on defense. So we got to have a, a ball pressure. We need support the next most dangerous pass. And we got to have a help person. And I need to hear you saying those things. 
So now we've loaded in some new information, and now they're going to play. And on offense, don't freeze the ball, 0.5 seconds. We heard a lot about that. And this is probably where I'm spending the most of the time in practice on some of these drills. And it might be, I might do two or three drills in this area, but I'm working on offense and defense at the same time. And again, this could be a teaching drill where I'm stopping and probably early I'm stopping them and reminding them, hey, we had to have a call there. What was your call? Are you in the right position? Helping each other out. Or it could be a learning drill where we're coaching on the fly. And then in the execute, are they, are they in the right place at the right time with their positioning? So did it transfer? So we're going to execute, and I'm going to use either golden snitch or horse. And I even got my golden snitch right here. Here's my little golden snitch. Here we can see it. And if you win the golden snitch, you get your picture taken, and we put it up on Team Snap. But what the golden snitch is in the game of Quidditch in Harry Potter, if you catch the golden snitch, you win the game. So we're keeping score. We're probably competing this drill but you can also win the point of emphasis of the drill. So let's say it's, we don't want to freeze the ball on offense. So I'm rewarding the defense every time that they make the offense hold the ball for longer than 0.5 seconds, they get the letter H. The second time they do it, they get the letter O. The third time they do it, they get the letter so on and so on. And if they spell horse, they win the golden snitch. Now, we don't use the word horse. I usually give the, they come up with a word they want to use. But it's, we're, we're keeping track of the point of emphasis. For the defense, we do it the opposite, right? So every time they don't, we would pick one. Every time they don't call ball and have ball pressure, that's a, an H for the offense. So whatever my point of emphasis is, I need a way to have a visible or some kind of scoreboard to help them understand if we're paying attention. Remember, put my, their attention on the right things at the right time. So I'm using those, and I find with the, the players I coach at the train to compete level and younger, they love this stuff, and it really helps them pay attention to what we're trying to do. And again, this could be a compete drill or a learning drill, most likely not a teaching drill. And then, so designing my practice, first of all, I always try to make sure I've got all four pillars, mental, social, emotional, basketball, right, and physical. I use a lot of Fergus Connolly's, what's my volume intensity? the density of my practice, in other words, how much rest in between things, and then how much contact do I want? I think that's an important one. And then what are my problems I'm trying to solve? But I'm also thinking of some of my culture things and my leadership things too. How am I going to make sure my, I give my players some leadership opportunities, and how am I going to promote my culture? So then we do pre-practice. I like them to play horse because I think it gets them being creative. They have to match the other person's shot, and they can be doing shots, they can do layups, they can do dribble moves into things, but it really starts to get them being creative, and it's a fun way to get them talking and moving. And then we do usually do a, a fun game approach, get them talking and connecting and get them energized. I think that's very important, get them to focus and get them connecting. And then we do our movement prep, especially to, on ACL prevention, making sure they're doing that, and shoulder stability, hip hinges. Then I like to do some competing. We play a little one-on-one -on -one pyramid, and then they work with some, or some skills in a one-on-one -on -one situation, offense and defense. It could be scripted or guided defense or live, but they're working on their competes. And then I would go into my first explore, exploit, execute of the problem of the day. And then I'd probably finish with a little sh shooting and a time and score. And then we go do an individual. And this is another one. I also try to do an IPP twice during in the practice where the total focus is on the individual because I I've, I've figured it out that they don't go and work on their own. And if I did it before practice and after practice, it didn't work. So I put it right in twice in my practice where I'm working on an IPP and the, the intensity is a little low. So it's given them a little bit of a rest too before we go into our next one because then we'll go into our next concept. Then we do our second IPP and then we're probably going into some kind of scrimmage with points of emphasis. And I've always tried to do a little shooting and time and score coming out of these things. And then we're going to do our cool down and do a little debriefing. So that's kind of the practice planning that I've been doing now. And I, I've really been enjoying, uh, first of all, the individual approach where the players get the IPP. But we're really finding that, too, they're solving problems. And uh, I, I've really been pleased with it. I just want to get some more experimenting going. Second thing is we got to have a safe learning environment. 
And I will always say we've got to cancel, cancel out these bad behaviors, bullying, abuse, harassment, discrimination. Uh, just There's no place for that in sport. And we have to make sure there's that balance between skill and challenge. And I think that's what good coaching is. I've always got to make sure the skills just equal the challenge. And then if it's, I push the challenge a little higher, make it a harder problem, the skills raise. I make it a little higher, skills raise. If the challenge is too great, they get frustrated. If the challenge is too easy, they get bored. And the hard part is how do I, I match that to the individual too? And I think that's, again, that art of coaching is figuring out how you can still do that within and not just do it for the team, but do it with it for the individuals within your team. And then they've got to be safe to be vulnerable. They will not learn if they're afraid to make mistakes. They've got to be willing to make mistakes. You've got to show that you make mistakes and mix, mistakes are celebrated because that's how we get better. And, and that's not always easy for us as coaches, and, uh, but I think it's an important one. I think this is one of the best things I've seen recently. And basically what it's saying is there's this idea of what's called regression towards the mean. And what they did was every time a, a player did poorly on the team did poorly on shooting, the coach yelled at them and, and they cried. Okay. And it says at the bottom that uh, every time that that happened, they they improved. When they shot really, really well, coach rewarded them and every time the coach did that they got worse so what happens to us as coaches sometimes if we use this approach is you start to figure out well i should never praise them because they just get worse and yet every time i yell at them they get better well it has nothing to do with you it has to do with just the regression towards the mean they're going to if they shoot really really well percentage wise they're probably not going to be as good the next time if they shot really really bad they're probably just going to get better the next time just because they're regressing towards the mean. So I think we, again, have to be aware of this is kind of like that, oh, I didn't know there was water. We're not really aware of what's actually happening. So I think the more you can pay attention and learn about some of these things, it can really help you. This is a book I read recently. I think it's an excellent book for coaches. And it, he talks about the two Ds, the C and the two Ds. But describe what you're doing, demo it, what's your cue, do it, and then debrief it. So. For me, the describing and the demo, we use the rule of three. So you have about three points only. You got about 10 minutes to do what you're doing. And then you got about 30 seconds to get them going. That's the hard one. And that's why, uh, to me, you get them going and then you can polish it up. But don't spend a lot of time giving too much detail first. And, and this idea of talking your demonstration. I think this is one when I evaluate coaches at the younger level. This is one of the biggest problems they have. Is they try to tell them everything they know instead of get them out there. And then the more you can base what you're teaching on prior knowledge, instead of saying, hey, this is brand new, say, this is exactly like horns, but here's the one thing that's different. Because if you give them what they already know, their, their brain already is, has a place to go to, to recall. But when you always present things as brand new, it just overloads their, their uh, learning. And then we need to develop a common language. And I'll talk more about this one. I think this is a big one that we, we have to do is come up with a common language that creates pictures. And this is what I've always talked about with Hubie Brown. I learned this from him years ago, but talk through your, through your drill. So line your players up who are watching sideline baseline and you get to talk through the drill and you get to see everybody's faces. You can see what's going on in the drill. You're not talking to anybody's back and, those are just little things I think that really, really help you in how you're going to describe and demo it. The cueing it. Example of over the front center of the rim versus lift your shoulder. Well, what the research will tell us is your description has to have, there has to be a description of what you want the ball to do. I want it to go over the rim. It is much better to have an external focus than an internal focus. And the reason is, is that when you talk internally, you have a tendency to freeze the movement. When I'm thinking about my shoulder, I'm probably putting some tension in my other uh, co-activation muscles in my shoulder area. The second thing is I'm thinking about my shoulder, thinking about my shoulder. Then all of a sudden at some point I got, oh yeah, I'm supposed to think about the basket. So you're actually asking me to, to do something that I'm really not doing. But when you ask me to do exactly what I'm doing and I'm focusing externally, my body is free to figure it out. And our body is pretty good at figuring out movement. 
And that's where that variability comes in. Now, you can talk internally when you're talking about something before they do it and after when you're debriefing it, but not when you're cueing them and they're trying to do actions. Don't freeze their brain up by giving them internal cues. And we want to create a vivid image. And I love this one. And I've even got mine. I got mine right here. My googly eyes. Coach Bree, you can see my googly eyes. I think this is a perfect example. Coach Bree used this by putting googly eyes on the little kids on their behinds and saying that your googly eyes or your defensive eyes have to face the basket because that's external. And that a cue you, hey, googly eyes, they know exactly what that means and what that's supposed to do. And with young kids, that creates vivid images. And, and the, we, we, we lose the fun and imagination, I think, as we get older. And I hope I never lose that in coaching. My greatest thing is that I come up with these fun, creative things that stick with the kids. And I think it can stick with older kids too, but you just have to present it in a way that works. Your analogies, this is the problem with getting old, your analogies don't work. Um, we used to talk about shooting out the top of a telephone booth. Well, if you say that to a kid today, they have no idea what a telephone booth is. And I can keep trying to say that, but it's more important that I come up with analogies or visuals that make sense to them. And that's why I think you got to, again, get to know your players and get them involved. Because the more it makes sense to them and they can picture it, the more uh, that cue is going to work and stick. And then the direction is over the front center and to the rim. So we always wanted to be trying to come up with these cues that give a description, give a direction of what you're trying to do, and they give the distance that you're trying to do it to them. Okay. I've always loved this idea. And any of my former students know that if they ever played me in uh, badminton or some of the pieces I used to golf with, I could mess up your golf game really bad because <clears throat> I just say, what were you doing on that drive? That was a great drive, but what were you doing with that little weight shift? Tell me about that. Like, what did you do in your, your grip there? I, your, I, how were you gripping that that time? And the more I got them talking about internally, especially what they're doing, I'd screw them up. And the same thing with teaching kids in Bampton. I'd play the best guy in the gym class. And how are you hitting that so hard? You know, like, tell me what you're doing. So, that was the exact opposite of what I should have been doing as a teacher, but, but it can mess you up when you start to think internally about your movement. Okay, common language. This is a silly little analogy, but I, I would say a beginning coach would see this situation, call the timeout and say, hey, we're, we got to play better basketball. Well, then they might have learned that, okay, i got to be more specific. Okay, we need to clean up our offense. Well, to me, the more you have a language to describe, hey, on the pick and the left swing, we got to look to reject and attack left to start dominoes. Now, if they know what those words mean, that created a very clear picture for them. And I would argue that most of us have to get better at our language to have really clear definitions of things that describe what we want to do. And especially in the storm of the game. And I've videotaped many, many coaches, and I hear these things. You got to clean up our offense. Well, there's too much room for everybody's mind to be in a different place. I need to direct my athlete's mind to the right thing at the right moment. And the more I can use language that can do that quickly, the better I'm able to cue them. And here's an example of two cues that I've been playing with. Because so many people switch. So this one is actually the mouse in the house. So when we have a, a small switch on to a big, we just call it the mouse. Look for the mouse. Or we got a mouse in the house. If it was the opposite and the big had switched out on the small, we call that one yurtle the turtle or look for the turtle. And we're not trying to be demeaning to anybody, but those are quick cues to, remember, hey, we got a mismatch in, in, in a time motor and a dead ball. Say, hey, we got any turtles out there? Yeah, my, my, I got a turtle on me. Okay, let's see. We can't play off that. So again, can you do this on the fly? Can you use your cues to fix things on the fly? And I think if you have good cues, you can fix things on the fly. Can you do them in dead balls or callovers? Can you fix problems by giving the cue? Can you do it in your stoppages? 
or does it have to be in a pregame and postgame? Does it have to be in a meet, or do you have to go back to practice the next day to fix it? And I would argue that a lot of us, we can't fix it until we get to practice because you don't have a cue to really bring attention to what it is that you're trying to fix. And the more you start to pay attention to the game and come up with those cues, the more I think you're putting your, the attention of your athletes on the right thing. Timeouts. Uh, when you're doing a timeout, what are you cueing? What if the problem is that there, and this comes from our, our pyramid, what if the problem is execution? And it's around, and they're not in the right positions, or they're not seeing the right things, all right? What if it's about composure? They're not connecting, okay? They're, they're not focusing. The other team just had a big run. Or what if it's about trust? Somebody's not trusting the team anymore, and they, they've converted back to old habits. They're hunting shots. You can drop the greatest play in the world, but if, it, if it, these are the things that need to be cued, then you're missing out. And I think our default, and mine was a, as a coach, was to draw up a play. Because I try to solve all my problems with a tactic. But yet that's not what nine times out of tens, that wasn't the issue. Now, that doesn't mean I can't draw up a play, but I may need a quick cue to get them back into execution. Now, I did have some videos on some NBA timeouts, but I found that the, the audio doesn't go too well on videos in this, but I could send you some. And you can just Google NBA coaches mic'd up and listen to the first part of most timeouts. It is not the tactic. It's usually around one of these three things. And then do you practice different scenarios? Like, do you practice physical timeouts where you, you're practicing taking timeouts because your team gets tired? Do you practice a mental timeout? where they're losing composure or not connecting. You practice social emotional where some is losing their resiliency. They can't pull themselves back up or do you sub in those situations? And then do you, do you take timeouts for skills or do you sub for skills? Do you take timeouts for concept problems or do you take them for strategies and tactics? So, so to me, you gotta be thinking about what are you gonna do when these are the things that are breaking down? Are you taking subs? Are you calling callovers? So I'm on the, on dead balls. Or you actually taking timeouts. And I really loved uh, Ross McMahon's and Zico. They talked about this idea of avoid, prevent, and punish. And I put together a thing and I could send it to you if you want. I could just uh, direct uh, message me. But about are you going to avoid doing something because the other team is, is do too dominant in how they're defending you? Just avoid it? Or are you going to do things to prevent them from doing it? Or do you have a counter that can punish the way that they're playing you? And I think that's a great way for us to start thinking about what you're going to do in timeouts. Okay, last little one here about your interventions or your cues is when to do them. Are you enhancing or reducing your athlete's focus? So I always use the analogy of a, a, a speed bump sign or a bump in the road. And that's the timing of when you give a cue. If you give it too early, it's probably like I say, hey, there's a bump coming up. Watch out for it. Well, they drive on for another hundred yards and then they'd stop believing in it and then bang, they hit the bump. It was too early. It had no impact. If it's too late, it's like bang, they hit the bump. And then I say, Hey, watch out for the bump. It's almost sarcasm. Right? It was too late. If I tell them right as it happening, I'm saying, watch out for the bump. They turn their head, what? And bang, I'm actually distracting them. So to me, I just got to find that just right time when I give them cues that enhances their, their performance. And I think sometimes we give too many cues in games, especially that are actually reducing because we're telling them things that they can't really hear. Or if they do hear, it's just taking away their focus. So you really have to pay attention to when you're giving your cues to the players. So the loading, and I'm going to go through this and kind of quick, but this is that working on constraints. There can be environmental constraints. And one of the ones I was really so proud of our senior team when we were in Belgium we knew we were going to play Belgium in a, a, a loud gym. So every practice uh, before we played them, we were pumping in the music at the times when you think it would have been the worst time to play music when coach was trying to talk. That's when, when we made sure we played the music. And it was so amazing to see the use of hand signals, the use of quick huddles, the use of callovers, because that's how they were going to have to coach in the game. And it really, really helped us. So that was an environmental uh, constraint we put on in practice to transfer. Very, very powerful. And the other one was that 
They were coaching from where they were going to coach. They're not standing out in the middle of the floor. They were coaching from the coaching box because that's where they had to do all this from. And I think sometimes we get so comfortable coaching in practice, stand on the baseline, stand at the top, but that's not where you coach from in the game. And do you practice coaching from where you're coaching the game? And then the person you got to know, you got to know the person. I'll build on that in a second. And then you got to know your task constraints. So I put down here is just doing a shooting drill where you put a constraint of somebody just stand there with a hand up. That's really going to impact them doing that over the front center of the rim. So this is our gold medal model. And this is where I think you got to know your players. You got to kind of have a sense of, of how the player is physically, mentally, social, emotionally, and in their skills, decision-making and where they understand the strategies and tactics and how those are going to impact them in some of this decision-making that we're trying to do. This, I'm not going to read it, but again, if you want, I can direct message this to you. But this is where some of these environmental things that can happen. So, uh, I mean, I talked about the noise and the fans, where you coach from. This one of where the change rooms are. Well, if you have to run up a flight of stairs, down a hall, up another flight of stairs, and then into a hot, sweaty room, um, is that w wise to go there at halftime? That's a constraint. Or do you practice that, that that's what's going to happen? And I'm going to have to get out of the locker room quicker. So you have to know those kinds of things and build them into your constraints. On the task one here, this is the one we mostly do. But it's where you can do things like changing the boundaries. I really love this idea that you can change the shape of the court and, and it doesn't have to be a rectangle. I'm liking this idea that you can do a constraint where it's a funnel shape. So the offense has to stay in the funnel and now it gives the defense a chance to create some disruption. And now once they steal the ball, they get the turnover, they can expand out to a full court so we can practice transitioning off of steals. It's one of the hardest things to do is practice is disruption sometimes because your offense knows it coming. But if I funnel them into a small space, I can get more help there. So there's a lot of neat, neat things you can do about modifying the tasks to improve the decision-making. Okay feedback and I've, I've borrowed this from this guy Andy Malinsky and I really like it and I know Chris does a really good job of talking about this type of feedback this the sandwich one um, where there's the two slices of niceness and then there's a the meat in between and I know we found that if this is the only type of feedback you give players sometimes don't even hear what you're saying of the of the, uh, the meat in between or they know that that's what's coming and that's the only thing they hear and Chris talks a lot. He uses one he calls keep plus add, which is, hey, keep, keep the dribble, but I want you to add a, a jump stop next time. Okay, so he's giving them, this is what you're doing good, but think about adding this. And then the last one Chris always talks about that I really think is important is you got to give them a chance to go back and, and, and use your feedback. That's the problem. Sometimes we give feedback at the end of practice and then they don't get the practice till next week. So as much as possible, when you give the feedback, give them a chance to redo it. And I'm, I'm a big person on, okay, let's redo it from where we just had that happen. Stop, feedback, let's redo that. Second type is this, this false confidence where you give so much goodness that they don't even hear the little meat inside. And I think that that can build false confidence. You just stroke the ego so much. I, I would not recommend this one. This one, I think, is where the new ones, and I have the picture there, this um, motivational interviewing. It's a very powerful, very good book to read on, and it comes from helping people with addiction and helping people in, in, in uh, very tough situations. But you ask the person about their performance first. You ask them first, and I've always been big on this. And then you ask them if it's okay if I give you some thoughts, my thoughts. And what I find is they're very open to that if you give them a chance to speak first. And it's a very, very powerful way to get some dialogue going with your players. Uh, this open face one is, again, another one that I'm very uh, big on. And I've, I've worked with our, our national team coaches on this, but it's uh, mostly with our age group coaches. But it's using your heads. So it's this, we want to hold them to a high standard, but with assurances, and we want to be direct and supporting and support to me means we're going to remind you and encourage praise with affirmations which is description of what you did and a breakdown conversation and i learned this from the the best person in the world at the time this was my mother 
And people will say to me all the time, well, Mike, you don't get after your players. I said, my mother could make me change my behavior better than anybody with never raising her voice because she would just say, Michael, I expect better from you. Or Michael, you know that's not right. I expect better. That would change my behavior faster than her yelling and screaming at me. And I think that's what we're trying to do. We can be very direct with what we see or what we hear, but we believe in you. And I believe in you. And that goes back to being a transformational coach. And I know you can do this. I've seen you do this. Or you're ready for this. You're now able to do it. You're going into your second year. You should be able to handle this now. And I think that's, you can be very direct and very specific. And you don't have to worry about all the, the extra strokes. Okay? And then there's the paleo diet one, which is, all meat and no potatoes. And to me, this is just, you're just giving them what you saw. And I think that's a very powerful one too. I saw this or I heard this. End of story. You don't have to say anything else. The other one with feedback is, again, this is knowing your players, but there's really three things that people want. Some people just want to be appreciated. And you got to recognize when your players just want to be appreciated. The second one is they want to know sometimes where they stand. Hey, coach, where do I stand? Am I going to start this weekend or not? And then the other times they want you to help fix them. Coach, can you help me with my shot? The problem is if I give feedback on the, the wrong thing, I lose connecting with my players. So if they want appreciation and I'm trying to tell them where they stand, I'm losing them. Or they want me to fix it and I'm just – saying, hey, you're great. I love it. You just do, just keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate everything that you're doing. I'm like, well, well, just tell me what I got to do. Fix my problem. So you have to really know your player and what it is. And we all have our default. And I would say most of us try to fix everything. But yet that's not the feedback they need sometimes. So you've got to really tune into that person and figure out what is it that they really need. And the best way I found is ask them and listen. We're almost there. The other one I think in your debriefing is, again, helping them build a vocabulary. Because I hear this one all the time. You'll say, well, how'd you feel? And the, co and the player, I, I, I don't know. Well, they probably don't have a language. So one of the ways I've worked on it is, is get them to compare. Hey, I want you to compare your last two shots. What was, what was it similar? What was different? And now they're starting to talk. Get them talking. Or... I could be more specific. Was that a back rim or was that a swish? So now I'm starting to get them into a detail, but by giving them a compare and contrast, I'm getting them to think about a language and what one is and what the other one is. Was that a hard shot or was that a soft shot? Did that have spin or no spin? And now they're starting to understand some of these nuances and I'm starting to give them a language. Or I can get them to do a rating. Rate on one to 10 how good your arc was that time. And now because they're starting to evaluate, they have to start to think about what a good arc was. And now you're starting in the con getting them to think. But too often we'll say, how did you feel? And they say, I don't know. And then we tell them a whole bunch of stuff. And we've just taken away the opportunity for them to learn and to think. The, the last ones here in debriefing is we are big on using these ABCs. And people who've worked with me a lot know this, but it's agree, build, challenge, and go deeper. So whenever we have a conversation, you can agree with the person. You can build by adding to it. And I love challenges. And then deeper is how will that impact you in the future? And it really gives that safe learning environment because it's okay to challenge. Truth to power, right? We want that. And truth over harmony. We want to have those ideas that it's okay to have diversity of thought. We want diversity of thought. We want to have, we don't want everybody thinking alike. And you have to find ways to get that in your, within your team. And then this whole idea of spotlight, I think Carly talked about that and Aaron talked about that, but really I think with the, with the female players especially, and I still think males too, I used to do with my football team, but getting people to spotlight somebody and say, hey, I really liked when you did this today and be very specific about what it was and why it was important. And then the last thing is just on debriefing is as coaches, and I think this is one thing that uh, our, with our, our national teams is we really put a lot of emphasis on them debriefing themselves. So what were you planning to practice today? What actually happened? What went well in our learning environment? How is our leadership today? How are we living our culture today? Okay. How can we improve in those areas? 
And then what's something we can continue doing, stop doing, start doing, increase or decrease? And what was the top three things we got from today? I think too quickly we, we debriefed the players after practice. I think you need to debrief yourself first. Debrief yourself as a staff. What did you plan to do and what actually happened? And, and I think this has been huge for us within our national program. And uh, that's part of my main job is to really make people reflect on what they're doing and asking those tough questions. And the last little one here is building accountability. And I really think this is important. Some of this comes from a gentleman named, uh, 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 oh my goodness, Bennett, Mark, Mark Bennett. And uh, he calls it a rule of three, but we already had a rule of three. So I call it you, we, me. So you are responsible for yourself. So I tell the players, you are responsible for you. You need to lead yourself. If you can't lead yourself, the we, the other players are going to hold you accountable. And that's that remind, encourage, praise, and breakdown. And if you can't, the, the team can't do that, then me, the coach, steps in. But I get more upset with the we, the team, and why are you not holding your teammate accountable? That's where I start with. I don't go after the player. I go right to the team. Why are you letting your teammate get away with this? Why are you not letting them call ball? So I think that's very, very important on, on building accountability. And we do a lot of things in warm-ups where we're getting players to, to be all right to hold each other accountable. You just can't do that right away. You've got to build in little activities that gets them to be able to talk about holding each other accountable. And, and again, because we're, we're trying to control the one person you control is yourself. Too often we try to control everybody else but ourselves. And I think you're trying to teach that life lesson to your players. Now, I hope this video shows with sound. Sometimes the sound does come through, but we'll see how it works. Yeah, no sound on that mic. Dave, could you hear that? No, no, it didn't come. Through. Yeah, oh, I, I, that's always the problem. But if you just Google, uh, uh, you can find that one. But it, it's Base McMahon's in the in the Super Bowl game. He's just basing time. Hey guys, we just got to believe in each other and we got to trust in each other. It goes back to that pyramid. And just stop. We got to be ourselves. Stop trying to be somebody you're not. He's holding them accountable, and to me, that that's what you want your players to do is hold each other accountable in those great moments. And, and one of my favorite scenes in the movie Hoosier is late in the game when he's calling the timeout to win the game. And he's trying to drop a thing where he's using Jimmy as a decoy and the guys all look like, oh. and he goes, what's the matter? And Jimmy says, I'll make it. Well, that's, that's what we want. We want the players to take, uh, empower it to take ownership and be able to speak up and challenge when they don't think it's, the same as what you think. And then and, and you as a coach realize it. Yeah, you got this. You're right. I was overthinking. So again, I hope this just gave you some ideas and some things that I've been playing with. I'm more than willing if you direct message me, uh, I can send you this presentation. I'll just put it into a PDF. Um, and I'm open to any questions, Dave, I don't know, because normally I have no idea what the time is. And I'm sure you're telling me to get off right now. <laughs> I mean, I'll get to one question here, Mike. Good. Uh, someone asked about uh, creativity and just basically how are you encouraging creativity but still staying to the team system well now see i'm always going to say context one of my main jobs as a coach is to transform them right i don't want them to stay who they are right now i want them to be transformed so there's going to be times in practice where i don't really care about the team system i want them to solve the problem so if we're working on a drill where we're, we're attacking and help defense comes and they throw behind the back pass, I'm probably applauding that because it was, tr it was solving the problem. They may not have completed it, but it fit the problem. Right? So, uh, but if I say, no, no, you always do a jump stop and throw a chest pass. I'm not allowing them to be creative. I'm not letting them solve problems. Yeah. So as long as it solves the problem, I'm not too concerned about, did it work or not, especially at younger ages? Now, when we get into the championship game and they've done that 10 times, then I probably made a mistake and I needed to do some intervention 
because that's probably affecting the team. That's the extreme, right? This is not the time because it's not solving the problem. You've turned it over 10 times. That's not working. It's not solving the problem now, okay? And so that's, that's what I would say. That's awesome. So lots of great stuff in there. And I tell anyone uh, that wants more, follow Mike on social media. He always gives so much and there's so much information on that. So uh, coach, I'm going to let you uh, uh, have some final words and then uh, I'm going to close it up. Well, again, I just think this is amazing. It's a great time for, again, to think for all of us to do some reflecting. I know that's what I'm doing. I'm taking lots of notes, reflecting, researching, talking with people and trying to get a lot of diversity of, uh, of ideas. And I think, Dave, again, a thanks to you and, uh, and to uh, Chris and to, um, uh, Tanner for uh, all the work that they're doing to help coaching in Canada. And, and I'm really proud of, of uh, what we're doing here in Canada. And I, and I think I want to see us do well with Canadian players and Canadian coaches. So thanks and all the best.